Well, uh, today we're going to talk about the life of Jesus. By the way, something that I have mentioned that I want to just mention again, just in case anybody wants to go, we are going to go excavate in Israel this summer, mid-June to mid-July, okay? You can go for one week, two weeks, three weeks, or all four weeks. If you go all four weeks, uh, you know, he's done a little marketing there. He makes it cheaper for that last week. So it's, what is it, $600 a week. Uh, but if you add the fourth week, you do the whole all month for 20, what is it, 21, 2115. Twenty-one fifteen, and that pays for your food. And, and I did, by the way, I did get an email from him. Part of the reason I wasn't getting emails, he was taking people to Egypt. He didn't have much uh, internet. But there will be some weekend trips that they will have planned from the dig. I figured they would. And so he said my students could join. That's typically people who take it for credit through him that come and do the early thing. So anyway. If you're interested, send me an email, um, and we can uh, set it up for you. You can get credit for it if you want credit for it, uh, or I guess you don't have to have credit for it. All right, last time we were talking about the life of Jesus, basically illustrations of the Gospels, and we went up through the birth of Jesus, went up to Nazareth. I think we talked about Cana, and then we made it to Capernaum. And that's what we have here, the picture that's on the screen now, is the modern um, church building. I say this must have been built around 2000, I don't know, give or take a few years, late 90s, early 2000s. And you can see it has pillars out there, and then it kind of hovers. I guess hover is not the right word. Float's not the right word. Anyway, it's superimposed on the site which means you can no longer walk under there now and, and see it, but you know you go inside the building and theoretically see it. This, this has, a, uh, here is the octagonal church structure with the house walls, and that up above is the actual, I guess the floor, the, the structure of the church, the new church. So they've actually made their church to be right over the top of the other church. You can still kind of see it under the building. You can go up in there and look down through the glass and see it. Technically, you're not supposed to take pictures here, although most people do. You see a lady taking a picture there. I don't know how I got this picture since it was illegal, but uh, there it is. And you get a nice view out there of the Sea of Galilee. So, you know, it's nice, and of course, since it's Franciscans, I believe, that have this, they are of the Roman Catholic persuasion. Therefore, Peter is considered to be the first pope. So if this is the house of Peter, we know that Peter was married. They don't bring that up much because he had a mother-in-law. Pretty hard to have a mother-in-law unless you're married, right? Because Jesus comes and heals his mother-in-law, right? Isn't that the way the story goes? I think it is. Anyway, you can double check it in what I call the Bible. I recommend it to you once again, almost every week I recommend it. Almost every class I recommend it to you. So, anyway, Peter. Now, the Jesus boat you should be familiar with. I have assigned you some uh, videos on that. Perhaps you've already watched. I think you have. And uh, if not, please do. This is uh, the so-called, I guess I'm, I put it in little, little quotes there, Jesus boat, because, you know, we really don't know if Jesus ever wrote on this boat. I guess what we're saying is, it's possible. It's a first century boat. It's in Galilee. Jesus was in Galilee in the first century. He did ride on boats on the Sea of Galilee. So... Did Jesus ride on this boat? Did Jesus ever see this boat floating out there with people fishing? It could be. You know, we don't know. But uh, the, uh, the video that you watch explains it in pretty good detail. I give a few pictures here of it. I give a little explanation of it here. 
uh, we see, here's my evidence that Jesus was actually on a boat. It says in Matthew 9, 1, Jesus stepped into a boat. Hmm, okay. He was in Galilee at the time. <clears throat> so this is a model of the boat, a replica, a small model. You know, it's, it's about this big. It's about uh, two feet long. They've got a little glass case at the kibbutz. The kibbutz is like a, you know, it's like a real tourist thing now. You go in, you know, I guess sort of like a little snack bar. They got a gift shop. They got some of this stuff in the lobby, and then you have to pay like, I don't know, 15 bucks or something to go back in and actually see. You see the video pretty much that I have you watch, and then you can actually see the boat itself, and you see some of the artifacts that they found. So uh, some of these pictures I actually took from the video while I was standing in there watching the video at the kibbutz. I don't know, if, again, if that was legal or not, but I did it. And so here we see uh, the boat itself as it was found. Basically, there was a very low level of water of the Sea of Galilee. And so uh, some people found this. They, you know, they found an outline of a boat. They decided, okay, maybe we should try to get this for the, and actually the water level is starting to come back up. Um, so they did this whole excavation, I think, in three days, four days. I mean, you know, had to do it quickly. The problem was, of course, the wood was like wet cardboard. It was flaking off, that sort of thing. So that it wasn't solid enough to actually dig it. If they would have just dug it out, it would have just fallen apart. So they kind of hollowed it out. They had to put boards across it. They had to um, remove as much of the soil as they could. They found some things that were associated with the boat, like a cook pot and a lamp and a few things like that that you can see. And then they came up with a rather, I guess, ingenious idea. They used foam. I guess a polyurethane foam. It's the kind of stuff, I don't know if you've ever, around here in Florida, I don't know if they ever use it, but there's this stuff that comes in a can and you spray it, and then it expands and gets hard. You know what I'm talking about? So a lot of times you put it around a window or you put it in a place where there's a, like a hole going in your house. You don't want alligators getting in there or whatever. So you, uh, you put this foam there, and then once it solidifies, you can actually trim it. You can kind of, you know, like make it smoother, even paint it, you know, so it doesn't look so weird. I've used it a lot in different old houses that I've had to seal up things. Well, that's the kind of stuff that they're using. You can see it here, where they basically put this foam all around it. Then they were actually able to get the boat to float because it had all that foam around it. They towed it not very far to the kibbutz. The kibbutz then put it and lifted it, and they put it in a special tank that they built. And here you see the people removing the foam. Then what they did is they, they flooded the tank with, again, a kind of a, chem, a polymer. And what happened was is that the water, you know, the sort of waterlogged wood came out and the uh, polymer went in and that had solidified the wood. And so for many years, if you wanted to go see the Jesus boat, you saw it like this. Uh, of course, this is before they put the liquid in. You just had to look down through the liquid to see it. I think there was a glass side. You could see it, you know, couldn't see it very well because it was kind of a thick stuff that it was sitting in. I think it was in there for about seven years, eight years, something like that. I forgot the exact number of years. And um, once they determined that was probably long enough, then they lifted it out and they made a special, I mean, pretty expensive thing to hold it on. You can see it here. Um, so this is the way it is when you go back in that room to see it. I took this picture in there. Was I supposed to? I'm sure I was for educational purposes. And um, so you can see this uh, kind of stainless steel thing to hold it, frame, I guess I'll call it. And uh, anyway, so that's what you see. 
Also on display in there are the, uh, here's the Roman cook pot, a Roman lamp, uh, some nails, there's a few other things like that that they found associated with the boat. Now the boat um, had been repaired several times, which I'm sure was typical of boats, you know. Um, it was kind of built out of one material and maybe got a hole, something happened, got damaged, they would fix it. Eventually it sunk, I guess, uh, not too far from the shore. It just got left there, covered by water, covered by mud, muck. And uh, then when the water receded, they happened to find it. So now you can go see it. It's not far from Capernaum. It's not far from, it's north of Tiberias and kind of south of Capernaum. So anyway. You can go see it. But, you know, I mean, it's a real tourist place. Busloads of people go see it. And um, it is rather expensive. So you have to know what it is. You know, this is really what you're going to see and paying the thing. But they've really turned it into a marketable thing for them. They spent a lot of money, you know, saving it. Um, and it got a lot of promotion. But... Um, now it's been a it's a real source of income for the kibbutz. They get bus loads of people, I'm sure, every day in there. All of them paying 15, 20 bucks each. Plus probably buying, you know, a five dollar can of Coke or whatever, something to drink, or a bottle of water. And then of course you can get your own placemats, t-shirts, I don't know, that have the Jesus boat on it or whatever. All right. So there it is. Yeah. Well, it's Jewish. Yeah, you know, the, the kibbutz yeah, system, uh, some of them are more religious than others. A lot of them are not, well, I shouldn't say this. So, some of them are not very religious. I don't know about this one. They don't really advertise that part. Since they are marketing to very religious people, for the most part, I don't think they advertise that they're maybe they're not that religious, but the, the, it's actually a, kind of a, a, I guess, a south part of the kibbutz, so it's, they've pretty much isolated that part of it with parking lots and this, this build, nice building that they built. So you don't really go on to the kibbutz proper or, you know, like where the people are living is to the north. I know that because when I've tried to find it before, I've sometimes turned in the wrong driveway and I've or the wrong road, and I ended up back in the kibbutz rather than in the place for this. By the way, this summer, when you go with me on the dig, you'll learn all about the kibbutz because we're going to live on a kibbutz, which uh, most of them started off as agricultural, uh, but then they've added other things to sort of keep up with the time. This, so this is an agricultural kibbutz, which now has a plastics factory on it some kind. I don't know what they do with plastics. The previous kibbutz I lived on it was agricultural and it had swimming pool cleaning equipment factory. You know, like those, they, they made like little robots that went in your pool and would sweep stuff up. And they had a big pool there. It was nice and clean because they would test all the stuff. They tested it in little tanks, but then they also tested it in the big pool. By the way, the kibbutz where we're going this summer, they say has a nice pool as well. So, I'm, you know, I'm not, it's, it's hard work, it's digging, but there is a pool. All right, let's talk about something else that's related to what I call the Gospels. How about this? This is one of the uh, thorniest problems of the uh, textual problems of the Gospels. What can archaeology tell us about it? Hmm, anything? Yes, I think so. Well, your textbook has a uh, extended discourse on this. And what he says, I don't necessarily completely agree with. So I will give you my view. You can read his view. I'm, you'll hear his view and my view. I mean, I'll tell you what his view is. By the way, I just uh, found out that the author of our textbook recently passed away. Dr. John McRae died 
died in his home in Nashville, I think in August or September, and I just saw the notification of it. Very nice guy, very nice man. I met him several times. Um, he had retired, had moved to Nashville. I think that was sort of his home, but he lived many years up around Chicago and taught at Wheaton College up there. And Wheaton, of course, has an, an MA in archaeology. They've had one for many years. Oh, which reminds me, by the way, here at beautiful SEU, we now have an archaeology minor, officially have one, that you could do. It's going to be in the catalog in the fall. Uh, it's an 18-hour thing. If, you take, if you've taken my ancient history kind of classes, you've been working on it, so to speak. And um, anyway... Uh, field work is a part of it. Going to Israel this summer would be a big component of it. We might be able to find you some stuff here in Florida you could dig on. If I'm still digging in Florida next fall, I suppose we could work out a thing there as well. So you don't have to go overseas. Uh, so anyway, enough commercials. Now back to pig, dancing pigs. Now, in the Gospels, uh, there is a place called... Uh, uh, Gerasa, Gergesa, and Gadara. Now, there's an event that takes place there that deals with pigs. Yes, pigs are in the Bible. So, uh, there is an occasion when Jesus is up at the Galilee area. He's actually across the Galilee. That is, he has gotten on a boat and gone to the other side, which was the Gentile side. So, they have pigs. And there's a demon-possessed man, if you remember the story. And Jesus comes up to him, and the demons uh, beg Jesus not to send them to the great abyss. But rather, why not cast us into those pigs? And then the pigs run down and jump into the lake. You remember that story? It's in the Bible. I recommend it. Well, it actually shows up. It's a confusing textual problem because it's in each of the synoptic Gospels. But there are variations to the text. So I give this as a, you know, and of course John McCray did too. I mean, it, this is an illustration of how archaeology, ge uh, geography, uh, and history can help you understand the text, you know, what the Bible actually is saying. Because over the years, these three names, which you can see, are similar. Gerasa, Gergesa, and Gadara. They're three similarly named places, which aren't that far apart geographically. I don't know. Probably, well, the furthest one away is uh, Gerasa. Gerasa is to the south in Jordan. So... Uh, but Gadara and Gerasa are probably 15 miles apart. I don't know, 20 miles apart, something like that. All right, <clears throat> so what does it say? Mark 5.1 says they went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. Matthew 8.28 says when he arrived at the other side in the region of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men coming from the tombs, met him. They were so violent that no one could pass by. And Luke 8, 26, they sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. So notice in the biblical text that you probably read, there are two different city names. One is Gerasenes and one is Gadarenes. So this is normally called the account of the Gadarene Demoniac. Which, by the way, I think would be a great name for the band. The Gadarene Demoniacs. And you could, like, play Christian rock music. No? All right, just an idea. I have ideas. They're not always good. Um, yeah, the Gadarene Demoniacs. And then you can, like, yeah, well, anyway. I won't, I won't uh, speculate any further because it'd probably just get me in further hot water. 
All right, so the cities there are mentioned, and here are our distances. Uh, Gerasa is 37 miles from the Sea of Galilee. Gadara is five miles from the Sea of Galilee. By the way, this picture that you see on the screen here is a picture of the Sea of Galilee taken from Gadara. Now, Origen, those of you who are in my church history class may have heard of a guy named Origen. Origen was an early church father who was a scholar and he wrote a commentary, actually, I believe, on the Gospel of John. Ironically, John does not mention this event, but Origen in his commentary on John does. And he suggests a third site, which is called Gergesa. Modern times, it's called Kersey. So once Origen mentioned that, then we start to see Gergesa appearing in some biblical texts. So, you know, as the person is copying, the scribe is copying this part of the text, then he gets to this place name that probably he doesn't know. And one says Gadara, and one says Gerasa, and now Origen says Gergesa. All of them kind of sound alike, but some will say, well, which place name is it? So some of them follow Origen because they figure Origen knows what he's talking about. Although that's really not in the earliest text, okay? So what is the problem? The problem then is one of geography, and I think of the similarity of the names. All of these towns or places are not that far from each other, and not that far from the Sea of Galilee, although uh, Gerasa is pretty far. So personally, I think Gerasa is right out. We just throw that one out. That's what I do. So then uh, what John McCray makes a case for is it should be Gergesa because Gergesa is right next to the lake. And then he says, well, if it's Gadara, it's too far from the lake for the pigs you know, to run down and jump in the lake. All right. So then some, some preachers, some other people say, oh, yeah, it must have been flying pigs or whatever. So they make a lot of jokes about it. So, you know, I actually examined this because I worked at a site called Abila, which is in the Decapolis, which is not far from Gadara. And so I visited Gadara many times. I've been to Gergesa a few times too. So here is a map just to show you uh, relative positions. Gerasa, I got an arrow because it's not on the map. That's how far away it is. Gadara, <clears throat> there is a river there, which is the Yarmuk River, which is now the border between Syria and Jordan, and Jordan and the Golan Heights, which used to belong to Syria, which is now occupied by Israel. So we won't politically comment on any further. Let's just say that that river just to the north of Gadara is a border. And it, Gadara, if you want to go see the site of Gadara, today they call it Um Kais, and it's, um, it's actually in the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan. Gergesa is in Israeli-occupied territory right along the Sea of Galilee, and Gerasa is also in Jordan. Okay? So here you see it, and there's Capernaum. You know, where did Jesus go? And so that's what this is showing, some routes, boat routes, overland routes, etc. I put it up there mainly for the map. And I believe that comes right out of your textbook, if I'm not mistaken. So here's McCray's six reasons why he argues for Gergesa. He says Eusebius has a reference in the 4th century to Gergesa. I think if you check into that, mainly Eusebius is recording what Origen says. Okay. So those of you in my church history class, you're familiar with Eusebius' ecclesiastical history because we're reading that in there. 
The other thing he says, number two, is, well, there's a church there from the 5th century, so that's in the 400s, which means that early Christians uh, recognized this is the place where it happened. And so they built a church there, okay, in the 400s. Uh, also, we have a 6th century tower. So, in other words, Christians associated with this site for hundreds of years as the site. Then he points to uh, geography and pigs. Obviously, pigs have to be in a Gentile territory. Good Jewish people don't eat pigs, at least certainly in the 1st century. They weren't supposed to. Let's just put it that way. I don't think they did. Today, I've met quite a few Jewish people that eat pigs. But if you go to Israel with me this summer, you will have to uh, take a vow of uh, no bacon. You're not going to get. You're going to be hard pressed to find a ham sandwich or or <coughs> bake, You know, like bacon and eggs is not going to be around. Okay, I'm just telling you that up front. So. Uh, by the way, you also won't be able to order that turkey sub with cheese because you can't have meat and cheese together. Because of a passage in Leviticus, it says you're not supposed to boil a kid in its mother's milk. And a kid, of course, would be lamb, and the milk would then be, you know, like cooking it in either milk or putting cheese on it. They say it gets in your stomach and, like, cooks it up. Uh, which, I, you know, I remember I went into a subway in Jerusalem one time, and I wanted a turkey sub with cheese, and they wouldn't give it to me. And I said, you know, no turkey uh, has any milk. You know what I mean? So... The pro, it's like a super extra prohibition. They just say no meat and dairy can be in the same meal. Yes? I got kicked out of a burger shop for walking in with an ice cream cone. And had some you cannot do that. I got an ice cream cone at the bagel no. shop across the courtyard. Walked yeah. over to where my friends no. were in the burger shop and got kicked out. No, you're going to get, no, you might, you might, yeah, they won't, you've got to get out of here. No dairy around any meat. That's the basic rule. Doesn't matter what kind of meat or what kind of dairy. Can't have them together. Go right ahead. For this subway, it has the meat in one like container and yeah. then the cheese in another behind the counter. Is you know, that, I don't, I don't think, okay? I don't think they had any cheese in there. They had. I just assumed they would have cheese, but you know, they they did. Yeah, there's no cheese, so you couldn't just get a cheese sandwich because, in fact, like on the kibbutz, we'll see at this kibbutz, the last kibbutz I lived on, they would serve uh, dairy at one meal, and then, like, that evening, they would serve meat. But you wouldn't have meat and dairy even available at the same time. What if you hid it? Well, you could hide it, yeah, but you're going to be hard-pressed to find. Be like him. You'll be kicked out. It's like, just take a whole thing of turkey. Yeah. Keep it in your room, and then it gets all funky. And then the green. Yeah, go ahead. Get the cheese. No. All right. If if you go to a store, you could buy turkey, you know, like sliced turkey or something. And you might, they might sell you cheese at the same time if it's a store. Then you could go back to your room and violate God's law all you want. <laughs> Just don't let anybody see you. So the geography of Gar... How did we get on this? Oh, pigs, yeah. Cheese, dairy. Uh, so, you know, the pigs, you know, the Sea of Galilee is very close to Gergesa. And uh, there is a very steep bank down to the sea. So, you know, the pigs could have run down there into the thing and drowned. And then, of course, a confusion of the names. So these are the issues as McCray lists them, which I do not disagree with. Uh, I just really think he dismisses Gadara without looking at all the evidence, and of course, maybe some of the evidence he was unaware of. Okay? So I will cover that. But here is the site of Kersey. You can see here a church, or the remnants of a church in the upper left corner. 
The doorway is at the bottom of the picture. The apse, the curved wall apse, is at the top. And then the picture to the right of that, you can see the steep hills and you can see the church from a ground view. And then the lower right, you can see uh, the pillars of the church and then a mosaic that's within the church that dates to the 5th century. And if you turn around from the church, there is a Sea of Galilee, okay? So it's close, although you got to watch for that truck. Pigs would have to avoid that truck. As I was around that. Now, of course, here's a couple things I would also uh, mention to you. It says that these guys were at the tombs, right? The demoniac, and in one case it mentions two demoniacs, uh, hence the name of our band, the Gadarene Demoniacs. Uh, it says they're at the tombs. Why? Because they didn't want these guys living in town because they're, well, they're demon-possessed and they do crazy stuff. So the tombs are outside the city anyway. It's not like they're right in the center of town. All right, keep that in mind as we move on. Now here is a map that actually shows you where the three sites are. The red circle, Gergesa, the one I just talked about. The blue circle, Gadara, which we haven't talked about too much. And the green circle, Gerasa, which you can see is quite a ways from the Sea of Galilee. So I concur that Gerasa is probably a textual alteration from what I think is Gadara, what McCray would think is Gergesa. Okay? All right, so what are resolutions then? I know you all had them. You made them back in January. You've already broken them. If you made them. And perhaps you had a resolution not to make a resolution. That's still a resolution. You probably resolved to do something this year. Therefore, you broke that one too. You know, like graduate or actually finish your classes or not get arrested. I don't know what they are. More than one event. That's what some people say. Well, for example, the text says Gadara and Ger Gergesa. They're very similar events. Perhaps there's two different events where Jesus cast demons into pigs and they ran into the Sea of Galilee at two different times. One event describes one, and one passage describes one, the other, the other. But of course, that still leaves the big question, what about Gerasa? It's just so far away. But in some manuscripts of the Gospels, we find it in all three. So I don't know how much you've studied textual analysis. So just, just in case you are unaware of that, this will just be a thumbnail sketch of it. We have multiple texts of biblical books or definitely passages. And some of those, um, you know, they're in Greek, and, so they're, and they're pretty early, but some of them have different dates. Some of them are earlier than others. Typically, those who go with textual analysis assume the earliest manuscripts are the most correct, have the least amount of variation. And so they once they determine that this manuscript dates to... 120 AD, and the other one dates to 200 AD, then they assume the one from, you know, 100 AD is more correct than the one from 200 AD, because there may have been more variations that entered into the copying of the text. Does that make sense? You know, what we do not have is the original piece of parchment or papyrus or whatever it was that Matthew, Mark, and Luke wrote on, we don't have those original manuscripts, but we do have copies of those manuscripts, some of them coming from different ages. But what I'm saying is, is in various copies uh, of the three synoptic gospel accounts that mention Gerasa and Gergesa, uh, we see all three of these possibilities mentioned, depending on how late they are. But what we do find is uh, most, most people today go with Kersey and Gergesa as the location because of the geography. 
And that's pretty much what John McCrae argues. You know, these other ones are just too far away from the sea, and there must have been a confusion, and Origen corrected it. Uh, but when you look at the earliest manuscripts, and again, you'd have to do more study on this, I think you'll find none of them mention Gergesa until Origen mentions Gergesa. Then we start to see it entering into the text. Okay, so again, are we, are we getting away from archaeology? Maybe, but what I'm trying to show you is the intersection of archaeological studies and biblical studies and textual studies. So the possibility that gets just dismissed along with Gergesa is Gadara. They just dismiss it. Why? Well, it's too far away. It's five miles from the Sea of Galilee. But I think that we should not dismiss it. I think there is evidence that indicates, good evidence that indicates, that the territory of the city of Gadara extended all the way to the Sea of Galilee. Yes, the main city is five miles away, but the city of Gadara had harbor area on the Sea of Galilee with a road that connected it, okay? So therefore, if we're talking, like for example, let's just say this, we're talking about any town you might come to, like I used to live in Grayson, Kentucky. Where does Grayson start? Where does Lakeland start? If somebody says, I'm in Lakeland, do they mean that they're uh, in the city limits of Lakeland? That they're, they're in the center of Lakeland? That they are just in the proximity of the city, Lakeland, right? And we might have different people say different things. Well, I'm going to Lakeland today. And so you might assume that means they're going downtown to you know, where all the swans are. That's Lakeland. Or... Uh, you know, they're out on Florida Avenue with all the stores. Or, you know, they might mean, well, you know, I live in Tampa and I'm going to Lakeland, but they might mean way up by the mall in the north, which technically is not in the city limits of Lakeland. So are they really in Lakeland? Technically, no. Right? Like where our friend back there in the back row, he doesn't live in Lakeland, technically. You're outside the city limits, right? You're in the city limits? I get Lakeland trash. Okay. You get, I assume when you say you get Lakeland trash that you mean the Le city of Lakeland picks up your trash. Yes. Well, we could all get Lakeland trash. No, like the city limits go down. It's a little okay, little all right. Bulge right over there. Okay, all right, that's good. Yes. You live outside of Lakeland, okay. Okay, but most people would think you live in Lakeland. If you just said, I say I live in if you ask people, ask you, where do you live? You'd say, I live in Lakeland, even though technically you don't live in Lakeland. What do you live in? Just the county of Polk? Yeah, Kathleen area. Yeah, Kathleen area. So, okay. Anyway, what I'm saying is, this brings up the whole issue of place names. What do we mean when we say the name of a city, the name of a area? You know, where I grew up as a kid, People ask you, where am I from? I say, well, I'm from the Chicago area. Well, you know, I didn't live in Illinois. I did not live in Chicago. Uh, I lived, you know, about 40 miles from downtown Chicago. Everything was focused on Chicago, all of our sort of culture and media and everything. But if I tell them the name of the town, and they're like, well, I don't know where that is. And I say, well, it's close to Chicago. So some people just say, I'm from this area. So, and, and this is, so this happens too, I think, in the Bible. Gadara, and when it says he's in Gadara, or he goes to Gadara, let's go back to that. Passages, right? Where are my passages? Way back here. Don't say I never do a review section. They went across to the region of the Gerizines, to the region of Gadara, to the region. See, they're not saying they're in the city. They're in the region. So where did that region begin? Here's your review again. Look at that. Double review today. Well, even though it's five miles from the city uh, to the lake, the territory stretched there. So that's technically still the region. How do I know that? Uh, when that same time, like when the boat was found, um, they also found outlines of harbors, harbor walls and 
stuff like that, docks that were exposed because of the low water. And a guy went around and mapped them and identified them. So here's other evidence. We have uh, the Decapolis cities definitely controlled territory beyond the walls of the city. The text doesn't say Gadara. It says the region of Gadara. Coins of the city of Gadara have on them boats and anchors and other nautical. For example, one, one of the things that Romans would do is they would have a um, mock naval battles. They would sometimes do them in theaters, like in, you know, like in the, uh, somebody I think mentioned it when they talked about the Colosseum. I don't know who wasn't mentioned. Was that you? Yeah. Uh, they would. Um, but they have that on the coins of Gadara. They did not have a theater big enough for a mock naval battle, but you could do a mock naval battle down on the Sea of Galilee easy enough. And recently, well, I guess it depends on how you define recently now. Now it's probably 15 years ago, 20 years ago, they discovered a harbor and has been identified with it. Now here is the uh, city itself, an outline of what's been excavated, a couple of theaters, a lot of roads. I mean, it's an amazing site. There's much more there to be excavated, by the way, if you're looking for something to do. Uh, if you happen to be, uh, if you have access to somebody's millions, let me know. We'll go there and dig it up. But here are some of the coins where you can see on it, like the lower right, you see the boat that's there. It's kind of harder to see it on the one above. But the coins themselves have boats. There is a theater there. The theater is too small, I think, to have boats in it. I mean, it has to be really small boats. Uh, so much better. I mean, just go, let's go down to the Sea of Galilee and have our mock battle for fun. We could sit up on the shoreline. We could watch it. But here are some pictures of the site itself as it's been excavated. And here are the uh, harbors, you know, the towns that you can see that there are harbors around the Sea of Galilee. And uh, Gadara's harbor would be way down at the bottom there uh, on the point of the Sea of Galilee. Okay? So that um, is it. Do you guys have any questions about that? So my argument, I guess, basically is you shouldn't eliminate Gadara. Gadara is in the earliest text. Gadara's territory does stretch to the sea. Uh, Gergesa, I think, is much later in the text. So, yes, Gergesa is a long ways, but not Gadara. Yes? So with um, Gergesa, is it... Um, better term, city limits, does that go right up to the Sea of Galilee, or? Uh, Gergesa never had a large city, so it's, un, you know, it's unclear exactly what the lines of the territory, let me go back to that, um, the lines of the city, here we go, but, you know, it's not far, so even if, again, you have to look at what do you mean by the word region? Does region mean uh, territory that is politically controlled? Or does it just mean I'm in the region of or the area of this town? But out of the three places, uh, Gergesa was would be very tiny. It would be more like a village. Uh, whereas Gadara and Gerasa were actual cities. Okay, so... Tombs at, at, they definitely, there are tombs at uh, Gadara. Of course, there's tombs at Gerasa. I think they have found a few tombs at Gergesa. Yeah, there's a few tombs there. So, I'll tell you also part of the reason why I, this is something that I don't usually mention, but I will. Uh, most of the sites that are tourist sites, you know, where they want tourists to come and visit things, <clears throat> the, uh, 
the bias is for people that live in Israel, for them all to be in Israel. <laughs> you know, and so uh, if you've got this nice site that's right along the road, or you can bring a bus along there and stop and get people to stop and pay an admission fee, um, why would you want to change that to an ambiguous place that doesn't have a nice place where you can stop the bus in Israel and let them see it? So, and also, I just think people in Israel are more aware of stuff that's in Israel. And what I found is they're not very aware of anything that's in Jordan. It's really, I found it very interesting. As I've switched, you know, as I was digging for many years in Jordan, then for like the last five or six years I've been digging in Israel. And people in Jordan have, uh, people in Israel vaguely heard about some of these sites, but they really don't know what's there and they don't really, they don't know the people excavating there, they don't really know what's going on there. Uh, because it's in Jordan, even though I can point and say, hey, you can see it right across there. Uh, but it is a real barrier because it's a political barrier, which also means it becomes a kind of academic barrier. All right, we better end it there for today. I believe we're out of time, aren't we?